Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm just going to wait a few moments uh, while people come in for the waiting room before we get on to our conversation today. So, good morning. I am delighted today to be exploring one of my favourite collecting categories, the rich and varied objet d'art or gadgets and gizmos, um, and for want of a better word, often called toys for boys, which is possibly a little sexist in terms of the uh, term and outdated, um, as it's certainly appealing to me as, as to anyone of the opposite sex. But I think, think glamorous, luxurious travel of the 1920s and 30s, or indeed going to war. Um, and during the Napoleonic Wars and the campaign furniture. But um, I think what a lot of these objects have in common today um, show ingenuity of design as well as aesthetic promise. So it's that perfect balance between function and form. And what is even more of a pleasure today is that it's the first Lepada leader webinar that is actually totally populated by Lepada members. So um, that is a, a real joy. And each of these members are are global leading specialists in their field and they've each kind of developed quite interesting niche categories of collecting. So without further ado, we have Tim Bent from Bentley's um, and uh, you will I'm sure be familiar with the antiques and vintage leather uh, and various other um, things that he proffers. We have Sean Clark um, from Christopher Clark Antiques who it specializes in campaign furniture and we also have Alan Hatchwell from Hatchwell Antiques who sell a plethora of things but you might particularly be familiar with their aeronautical optical and 20th century design. So um, I think one of the things that is very uh, interesting for me is that each of you represent quite a niche market. And um, I just wondered before we kind of got into looking at some of the objects that you sell and learning a bit more, um, how you actually develop that sort of specialist knowledge and what drew you to that area. So I'm gonna start with the oldest collecting category first with Sean with the campaign furniture and then we'll, we'll move the conversation around. But, um, how, how did you get into this world, Sean, of, of campaign furniture? Well, I, um, I started off, uh, obviously the family has um, had the business since the very early 60s, but I never worked for my father. I started off working for um, a specialist in sporting antiques, Manfred Schotten Antiques in Burford. And he offered me a job and I said, well, I really don't know if I want to be an antique dealer or not. Let's give each other a month and see how we get on. And because he was dealing in such different items to my family, and it was all involved in sports, I mean, he was basically the first dealer in sporting antiques. Uh, golf clubs, tennis rackets, uh, art on rugby. It was a very different way of dealing. And this was before the internet, and we would be sending out lists of early tennis rackets to collectors or golf arts. And so, when my brother and I took over our father's shop, he didn't deal in campaign furniture at all. We wanted to specialize in something and because of what I'd learned at Manfred's. And it took us a few years to find campaign furniture. We'd always been interested in it. We didn't know if we could find enough out there and we didn't know if there would be enough people interested in it. Um, a friend did a book on it, uh, British campaign furniture, elegance under canvas, Nick Brown. We put a few items in the book. He asked for a few items of ours. The book sold incredibly well. We did an exhibition and people just said, we've been waiting for a shop like you. Amazing. So we went for it. Amazing. Thank you. Um, and actually, just before I go on, I what I omitted to say is that please do feel free to put any questions you want to put to our specialist today in the Q&A function at the bottom and in the chat area Gillian will put some links to um, the websites um, and to any reference materials and things we talk about in the chat field. Um, so so Tim to, to you how did you how did you fall in love with Louis Vuitton and Goyard and all of these things? The world for I started collecting <laughs> when I was at school and I soon started dealing in vintage clothes while I was at school. And that led from that sort of Savile Row tweed suited uh, English gentleman and that whole look that I did then quickly developed into the accessories that that 1920s gent would have carried with him. 
And I found actually that's really what appealed to me. And uh, it, in the late 80s, you could access that market really quite easily. It was um, the prices were incredibly reasonable. So I just ended up with mountains of leather suitcases that I would merrily <laughs> polish at home and then sort of sell to friends. And I got stopped in the street by an Italian carrying a pair of Gladstone bags. And um, he persuaded me to sell one of them. And I thought, oh, this is quite an interesting little niche. So that sort of is what sparked it. And it then developed into learning more and more about sort of the sort of luxury brands of that era. Vuitton, of course, the most famous, but Asprey and Drew and Sons, there were an awful lot of English makers of that time as well. And that whole romance of travel from the sort of late 19th century through to the heyday in the 20s and 30s um, is what captured my imagination. And it sort of the business grew from that. Amazing. It's, be, it's a wonderful, wonderful shop as well. It's a real pleasure to go into it. Um, Alan, let's go while we're traveling. Uh, <laughs> you take those things apart. So t talk to us about how you how you develop your kind of specialist eye and knowledge. Well, I, 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 my, my, my father had started the business in 61 and as a classic sort of well, European traveling dealer, being with Bede Meyer and those sorts of things. And then uh, uh, about uh, 25 years ago, I, I sort of, I was a sort of, I actually went into, a, into an aircraft uh, hangar and, and, and saw some things that were uh, quite exciting and uh, well I thought they could be exciting and we and we thought well what can we do here so um, we were our first sort of delving into aeronautical things and scientific things was actually a pair of uh, Concorde engines and Concorde hadn't quite uh, stopped then or was just around that time so nothing there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, strangely wasn't a lot of interest and then and that led on to scientific instruments and then development as you start this the wonderful thing about the trade is that you you it just it just uh grows it's like this amazing tree that you start with one little thing like so an aircraft part and then you lead on to discovering how somebody actually developed the part of that engine and i know it, it sounds very uh, niche but actually you you start encountering these extraordinary people that are that are responsible for how the world runs on the, and and it's you know, as much a piece of technology and scientific instrument as it is as a, a beautiful bag or a beautiful, you know, this, this um, Sean is early technology and early 20th century luggage. And it's an extra, you know, uh, that we, and I went forward into that and that developed into scientific instruments as, such as binoculars and the naval instruments and pianos and that's through the design side. So, uh, I, and I was very lucky to be involved with a family, with a father who, traveling was very easy and logistics were just not even a consideration. It was just like buy something, put it on a container and ship it, you know, it's, it, and, and I think that has been part of the, the ability to be able to grow in a, in a, in a rather strange way, you know, not be frightened of something that weighs half a ton or, or, or is nine foot long. And that, <laughs> although it doesn't fit in every living room, it's, it does uh, challenge the perspective as when, when people encounter the shops it becomes quite an interesting and enlightening environment. Yeah, <laughs> your, your shop is like an Aladdin's cave. I mean, it, it's it is just, probably, probably too much. Lots of, of things out of scale. It's extraordinary. And oh, yeah. I, I sort of, yeah, your father might have found 2020 quite frustrating uh, <laughs> in terms of travel and logistics. Um, I know we're going to have a look at um, some of the images of things you sell in a minute, but I'm quite interested to know um, how in terms of developing the business, were there sort of outside trends and influences that actually helped shape the direction of, of and, and actually how you kind of built the business? And I think I might start with you, Tim, on that, with in terms of the luggage and things, were, were there trends and things going on that helped promote your business? Yeah, I, th I think the ironic thing is that it took an American to <laughs> really kickstart the appreciation of that sort of Edwardian look. And, and when Ralph Lauren decided that he would take tweed and make it fashionable and very fashionable. Mm -hmm. And as his influence grew around the world, that really did sort of spark a, a complete sort of reevaluation and maybe a generational reevaluation as well, where people 
had seen luggage and suitcases as heavy and impractical and why on earth would anyone want to carry a leather suitcase or even have a leather suitcase in their house, it kind of became an accepted and, and understood look that actually these should be appreciated as just a beautiful piece of craftsmanship and of uh, that sort of warmth of the leather and the warmth of the you know, combination of brass and wood. And so Ralph Lauren really brought that into the living room and, and you know, trunks really from that time have been used as much as decoration as they have as a practical sort of traveling thing. There are still some people that will travel with them. We sell a lot for vintage cars and things. Um, but you know, the main market is still decoration. And then there's that sort of slightly rarefied collector as well who sees yeah. it as a, a collecting field. I, uh, this is this is a completely sort of by the by, but one of the first things I worked on was Christie's South Ken. We sold this teddy, Stife teddy, for mm. a fortune, and I was actually sort of holding it as the bids went up. And uh, it was then travelled to Japan in a Louis Vuitton case that was made just for Teddy Girl and her outfits, and she had her own seat on the plane in her Louis Vuitton trunk uh, oh. to go there. But anyway, that's another... Um, for, for you, Sean, it was a, a book and a, and a sort of a, a dipping your toe and then it taking off. But were there sort of outside influences and, and people interested in? Um... Well, we, we decided fairly early on through the outside influence. I mean, they probably don't even realise of Whitney Antiques, who, of course, specialised in samplers, still do. Yeah. And we saw the way that they put together these very smart catalogues full of information that were a fantastic selling tool. And also, they, there was so little written on samplers, one or two books perhaps, but they really added to uh, the academic knowledge of the world of samplers. So we decided right from the beginning that we would make our catalogues a big thing. Um, and really try and save and add as much information as we can about campaign furniture and its makers and also its users. And a, a big part of our business is research um, and uh, hoarding this information. I mean, our, our archive, probably like uh, Tim and Alan, is, is huge. Mm -hmm. um, so they were a very strong influence, uh, Whitney Antiques, to, uh, as a business model. Mm. Um, but I don't think there's anybody else really who's specialized in campaign furniture. Still, there's dealers who like it and have two or three pieces. But I think probably because we did our catalogs from fairly early on, people just looked at us and thought, well, they're fairly well set up. Um, we're, we're never gonna catch them up. Do you think that, hot, but that's the sort of, this is a dreaded, dreaded word and forgive me, but just thinking about the ingenuity and the skill and the craftsmanship about creating something that's portable and flat pack. I mean, the, the sort of advent of the IKEA monster, did that just allow anyone to just really understand the real skill and craftsmanship of a few hundred years um, before? In well, terms of that. yeah, I mean, funnily enough, um, the name Ikea does get mentioned in the shop quite an awful lot by customers, but they always follow it up with, but of course the quality of this is a thousand times better. And yeah. obviously with Ikea, it's meant to be um, set up once you can work out the instructions eventually. And, <laughs> and, then, and all the pieces are included because they may not be. <laughs> and they're never dismantled again. Whereas with campaign furniture, uh, you set it up, you take it down again, you move camp, and on you go. And so the uh, necessity is a mother of invention, of course, and some fantastic design has come out of having to make something to be portable, to dismantle, and the different ways to do it. And of course, originally uh, in the 18th century and with the Georgian furniture, it was very much keeping the look of the domestic furniture. But if you looked underneath it, you'd find hidden hinges or bolts and it would dismantle. And then through the 19th century, it developed its own look, the classic look that we, um, we know now of a campaign chest with brass corners and brass straps. 
I think thank, we're going to take a look at those in a minute. I think what we might do is, Alan, we'll move on to you and maybe if you talk us a little bit through, but show us some, some images as well. Um, and I think we've got Gillian online ready, poised to maybe share her screen um, okay. so that you can kind of talk us through um, some of your areas. Are you, is that okay, Gillian? Are you? Oh, here we go. Oh, okay. I think we got to... Uh... Okay, I'm going to talk about three things which has which have a link. Um, okay. Just, so so uh, the first one actually is the wow. Leger Torpedo, uh, Gillian, actually. I hope you've got the image. Yeah, that's it. There we go. Okay, so um, uh, the, the, this, so um, we deal in sort of quirky scientific stuff and, and things that uh, I, uh, I find exciting. And, and this was a rare piece, actually, that I found um, about a year ago. Um, and it's a very early torpedo. Now, um, this was made by a company called Leger, who were involved with Kelvin Hughes and they, they, uh, Lord Kelvin who, uh, uh, at the time. And, and this was a traction torpedo, which means it was pulled. And it was, it was pulled behind, it was developed, this is 1886, and it was, it was designed to be pulled around behind a boat or across a harbour entrance to protect ships. Um, uh, and, and, and moored ships or harbour entrances. And uh, there's, you can see the point at the, at the front. Uh, that, has a, that is actually a charge and it's set off uh, when it, 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 it impacts on something. But um, it was quite, it, it, it actually didn't go into a lot of, uh, a lot of um, development because uh, they, they were very scared that actually it might just run into their own ship and blow their own ships up. So there was, it, was, it was very hairy days, but the, the, the that uh, the, the, the torpedo is an uh, extraordinary object because it, it transformed what was to come and transformed uh, uh, armies. And then this leads me on, this was an, a pulled object. Now, the second piece is a gyroscope, a torpedo gyroscope. Yeah, uh, and I've actually got one here, which is a bit later. But the, 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 the gyroscope was a guidance system and it was first, uh, just stop me if I'm going on too much, but the, the gyroscope was the system that actually guided the torpedo, and it was invented by a guy called Whitehead, uh, who was an English fellow, and uh, he yeah. tried to sell it to the British Navy and everyone else. But actually, the, it was it was the Austrian Austro-Hungarian um, um, who who believed in it, and this little piece here, which is that's called an Aubrey system, and it spins around. I, I can show you this. Basically, you can see it on my screen. I think that, we might have uh, to we might have to go not Here share the screen so we okay. can see you again oh, and then okay. we'll be able to see it this better. Fellow, that, that's what it is it's a, it's something that spins and i don't know if you want a fay with the gyroscope wow. but as soon as you have something that spins it means it's difficult to move and you can reverse that movement into guiding a torpedo straight and and going straight and and at a certain depth so it's a monumental little bit of engineering that transformed world history because until that time the, the way you imposed your power was or with a very large battleship which had very large guns and lots of them. So then you could just go around the world and, and that's the history of the empires and how they grew. Uh, suddenly with this little piece here, which was really a, a tiny, a very low cost, you could attach it to a, a, a torpedo and, it, and, and you could, you could um, with a small fast boat, you could, you could endanger very large fleets. So that completely changed the naval naval back exactly a naval balance in the world um and then so my, my we're allowed to one, ask prices for some of these things yeah you can ask whatever you like yeah, uh, it was fine, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the big torpedo the torpedo i mean it's there's only one or two in the world and that's around twenty thousand. the gyroscopes okay. are at three thousand, um and uh they're quite rare this the one i've shown you is actually a very a very uh it's quite a modern one but it's extreme they're all they're gas powered they're uh, compressed and we just had a question come in because it's yeah. not worth waiting till the end asking how big the torpedo is what are the dimensions it's Do one meter one meter 56 long it is okay thank and you they're, they're very detailed images of it on the website <laughs> okay carry on sorry <laughs> and then but finally i won't keep them long finally there's a photograph of a pair of binoculars which tim of course is very au fait with and mm -hmm. these are, I'm linking, I'm linking it because they're always, they're Japanese and they're made by Nikko, who are the, the now known as Nikon. And, and they're Second World War binoculars. They're, they're substantial. They're about um, uh, 36 inches long. 
uh, and and they, the optics are all German because they, they were buying optics from Zeiss and, and Schott and all that those sort of people in Germany, and they were they're described as nighttime torpedo binoculars. So they but they were made for the Imperial Japanese Navy, and they magnify ten times. So there, there's a link. So the Japanese didn't weren't really they were very um, they felt that they uh, quite superior and they weren't developing radar and, and the such so much so they they concentrated on their optics and these are a fabulous pair of binoculars which have sensational quality uh, which uh, of viewing quality because it's all about the glass mm -hmm. so uh, I, I, I want to give you a little link of how things develop you know and suddenly you're, you so you go from the torpedo to actually worrying about the tor guiding the torpedo and then and then watching the torpedo so and, and that's what I, I wanted to talk to you about and uh, and show you that how, how things link and that's really you know the beauty of the, the business and how yeah. you, you can just expand and it, it captures you you know so there we are and these are each quite i mean you know substantial size but in terms of some of the other things you sell are sort of large scale yes we yeah these are, yes we do we i mean we're very well known for our wind tunnel models aircraft wind tunnel models which are yeah. uh, all the models developed for airplanes to fly and now actually we're, we're trying to get into sea uh, ship models, but they're they're really big. They're like 15, 16, and they're not many of them for obvious reasons. <laughs> but it's it's surprising yeah. how long the the, the, the tanks, the, the the ship models have been going. Because yeah. they're very uh, they've been actually the, the the one up in Scotland, or there was one in Scotland, and they were testing models in water uh, in in the beginning of the 19, uh, beginning of the twentieth century. You know? It was quite it's quite advanced flow tank models that were designed to measure flow Amazing. and so. You know that that's that. I mean, I I must say that I think when you asked how how the how the business develops, I mean, I people like Sean and Tim, uh, and and to a degree us. You know, we've actually we we've we've set. I actually feel now. I mean, uh, I dare say that we've actually set trends and uh, mm. the campaign furniture and and the luggage. You know, there aren't so many people that have done it, but. By, by promoting the uh, online and shows, you know, suddenly it's captured people. And I, I think very much a lot of the big dealers and the dealers around that us, but they, they do set trends and it, and it flows. I mean, we see it a lot actually. So um, yeah, and you, it's generated by the dealers as, as much as, as by society really. Yeah, I mean, I think you've, you've each of you have sort of spearheaded these, these movements and, and they're the leaders. Um, do, do you find, Alan, in terms of how do you source these objects now? Do people come to you if they've got something like this to sell because they know who you are? Or are you busy trying to go into various hangars and warehouses well, across the world to source we, some of these things? Yeah, we, we have a lot of people that offer, offer, offer things, but, um, uh, uh, that, you know, it's, it's harder to find now than it was. And, and also be, the, the Internet makes... Is a double-edged sword. I mean, it's fantastic for sourcing, for, for education, mm -hmm. and for research. It also uh, it also takes away that ex the energy that you put into doing all that work, and and shows people exactly what you know. From they can go from one thing to another straight away, from from source to, to retail, basically. So uh, overall, the, the web is sensational and a positive plus mm -hmm. for for everything, really. But. It, um, it, it, we, uh, you know, we, we get offered, we're known for it, and we travel everywhere. I mean, it's worldwide now. You know? We can find things it, everywhere. It, yes, <laughs> thankfully, our virtual <laughs> existence, thankfully. Yeah. So, Tim, onto, I know you have an amazing um, archive, um, yeah. and I think that is quite interesting in terms of, again, each of you sort of leading, being leaders in your field, that presumably you're, you're a resource. I mean, if I was going to ask where somebody should learn about this discipline, it's probably going back to each of you. Yeah. Um, I, I maybe talk to us a little bit about that and then, and then go through to show us, because I know you've put together some wonderful images so that we get to sort of have a look at some of the items you sell. Yeah. I mean, I think the archive is, is incredibly value. It's a, it's a very easy way to share that information as well. And, you know, we have a real connection with craft and craftsmen and the archive of imagery that we keep on the website, you know, is often used for, by them. I, I had a, um, a, a German craftsman who got in touch and said, you know, I really do refer to these all the time because the skills have either been lost or very nearly lost and it's that 
sort of perfection of the skills that you see in you know, a, a, a piece of leather from 1900, where really it didn't get better than that. And, and those skills, you have to have a visual reference for that. We've also built a really big physical archive as well. Um, so the shop is very much about the sort of pieces in the best possible condition and the best quality we can find. But actually there's, it's really interesting to reference a smaller piece or a particular detail on a trunk or a case. So we built it and, and share that archive as well. So I think it is a really important resource and I'm sure you know, Sean and Alan, and Alan as well, you know, it, it's, um, it's, it's good to be protected. Well, presumably as well. Yeah, you're protecting it and you're keeping it for the next generation because without dealers like you, actually the, the knowledge and, and um, ability to sort of research and understand these items may very well disappear. Like, I mean, we won't get into the ivory conversation, but um, that, that is something that may happen. But um, Tim, maybe show us, so can you talk us through some things so we can see some of the yeah. pieces? Yeah, probably, you know, I should think- Oh, here we go. Oh. Right. One of the things where we are most well known for at Bentley's is our collection of, of vintage Vuitton trunks. And uh, I mean, these almost fall into a field and a category of on, on their own. That The sort of luxury brands is something that we specialize in. And, and there are really strong collectors and archives, particularly just for Vuitton or for a company like Goya. And the luxury brands actually do protect their own heritage as well. And so Vuitton themselves have 25,000 pieces of vintage luggage that they've made. So, and Hermes actually have an amazing collection, a broader collection in some ways of examples of campaign furniture, but and of their own leather work and pieces that inspire. And, and I think we do find a lot of designers come to us looking for inspiration of, you know, a, a detail or a, and perhaps an understanding of a style from a particular era. Mm -hmm. So uh, this particular enormous wardrobe trunk, it's not something you'd ever want to carry yourself, but of course they never did. They never had to carry anything. Yeah. So weight was completely secondary. Um, it's a very unusual constru construction. It's an upright, um, really sort of in the flesh. It's a really imposing piece of furniture now. Um, but it was used, it was built for function. It was probably a man, this one possibly for a man. Um, it would have had a, a tray underneath, that's of a drawer underneath as well, but it probably would have taken 20 or 30, perhaps more, even more than that, suits. Though yeah. it, it would have weighed a lot. The so one- you, In the tray at the end, it, was that for shoes and stuff? Is yeah. that- Shoes right. and pants, yeah, right. yeah. Um, the other, which has all of the drawers on the right hand side, hanging yeah. on the left hand side, is a more classic style of wardrobe trunk. Yeah. Um, okay. And all of the drawers are either divided or they were, uh, you know, for gloves, for scarves, ties. Uh, and this one, you could actually hang uh, a dress as well over the longer um, hanger on the left hand side. So, again, very heavy, but beautifully constructed. I mean, incredibly strong and it, it's remarkable that they've survived, but testament to how well they were designed in the first place. What else do we have? That's, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm a massive Land Rover fan, so <laughs> that was a, an indulgent photograph. Of that was brilliant. I love that photograph with the sort of fishing bag and the yeah. tackle bag on the side yeah, as well. Uh, is, that the tackle? Is, that, is, that, is it fishing tackle? Yeah, okay. it is. there's a yeah. Yeah, lovely leather top creel. So yeah. I mean, we've got a lot of sporting um, pieces as well from that. It's gorgeous, great photo, great yeah. photo. Okay. Um, so th uh, this is a, a beautiful dressing case. I, I just think this is so evocative an era that it, mm. to think that you w would travel like this, it's actually, it's it's quite similar to the, st to the way that campaign furniture was used. It was that expectation that you would need an entire tortoise shell dressing set, crystal bottles, silver mounted, you know, we wherever did. you went. I mean, it, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and the quality of that is just exquisite. It, uh, but actually the case is very discreet. That, that's yeah. really my favorite Vuitton is that leather, the best quality leather, very understated, 
But if you know where to look, you'll see their branding. Every single stud is branded. Really? Marked, all of the clips are marked. But it's really, you know, subtle. I love that. Gorgeous. Okay. Have we got any? Oh, yes. I'm... <laughs> so for your salmon fishermen, this is where the shop really is developed from, you know, the, the core is always going to be luggage and, and leather is what we're best known for. But we have a really big collection of gentlemanly silver. And so some, how, is, would, how much would something like this be? This is a sort of thousand pounds. Yeah. Yeah, what's his what's his eye so you got a gem yeah, it's, a, it's a glass eye a red, it's a, a, red glass. a really glass eye yeah yeah but it sits in the hand so well it has it's a, a swimming salmon and so it, it has a beautiful it. it was made in 1914 it has its original case which is fantastic and so unusual to see but it just there's something about craftsmen craftsmanship of that period where they knew how something should feel and that the curve of the salmon as it moves just sits in the palm of your hand. It feels absolutely beautiful. This is so crisp. You can feel every scale. It's a and the, the tail, the definition on the tail is just yeah. beautiful. And the and fin. And and the... The tail. It, it has all of the hallmarks and it's a registered design is marked on the other side. It's just yeah. a lovely thing. And though it may well sell, it's you know, a very gentlemanly thing, but it's just as likely to sell to a woman who's looking for that special present yeah it's a, a really charming thing amazing thank you oh, and we've got oh uh, yeah the english picnic not the weather for it today where i am but <laughs> that's <laughs> very clever right it's actually it's completely waterproof so they oh, lock well, down they obviously knew, this is an english set made by coracle uh, or under the brand coracle by scott and um it has a sort of weatherproofing system that it closes so tight and the lock has a little clip that hides the keyhole so it was totally weatherproof but, uh, so it was indeed designed for an English picnic and has it got is it bamboo or something yeah it's, it's, it's rattan bound all of how the, uh, gorgeous the so that it gives some extra protection so, so what have, we've got that so you've got the cutlery you've got thermos you've got sort of condiments yeah, jar. yeah butter and butter and um, uh, sugar uh, it's all the original teacups all Amazing. in both colors. And all of the glasses stacked together as well. So it's, it's, it's as compact as you could make a picnic set for four people. And it was designed you know, to strap onto the running boards of a Bentley or a Rolls Royce of the twenties. Just put oh, that's got to get, that's got to have a good home. That's absolutely wonderful. Love yeah. it. Okay. Is, oh, and now, okay. And, Here and we go. Is, yeah, that is the shop. So, I mean, is that the shop or is that a stand at maybe our fair or something, or is it the shop? I That's actually like the shop, but actually the, the, okay. the stand at the part of the fair looks very similar. Very similar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is a bit of a treasure trove. You never quite know what you're going to find in there, but um, yeah, it's got. Um, and it's and the 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 chair, the sort of could be equally at home in Allen shop as well, couldn't it? There's, there's some crossover between. Yeah, yeah. and Martin Brilliant. paper rejector seat. It's like the ultimate bit of English engineering that has yeah. saved so many lives. I mean, it it and still a privately held company. Still really, company. yeah, amazing. amazing piece of engineering. Oh. Thank you. And then Goya um, as well. And this, yeah, there's a, a beautiful Goya wardrobe trunk that, interesting brand, really, is, it was sort of the, relatively unknown in comparison to Vuitton, but now it's a real collector's, uh, a real collector's piece and, and a very successful brand. Do you think that's also because they had a, I mean, they really had a sort of, maybe is it 10 years ago, 15 years ago, where they suddenly really sort of pushed themselves in Mayfair and Paris again. It, it yeah. felt like it had gone very understated and then actually, there was sort of quite yeah. a marketing push behind them. Yeah, they've never advertised. Uh, it's it's owned by Jean-Michel Signolo. He's a very enthusiastic collector. He he, he was yeah. a collector. He had 400 pieces of Goya and eventually persuaded the family to sell to him because they trusted that he would keep it in the way that they thought oh, it should. And, and it's grown incredibly successfully, but still quite understated. Um, Amazing. Thank you. Well, I think we might move on to Sean because I'm sort of aware that time is marching on and uh, we've got lots of other things to talk about. And I really, I mean, I know you've got some pictures to show us, but I'd love you to tell us a little bit about some of the 
uh, helmets behind you as well that are launching today because it's quite nice if you've got something that you can actually handle and show us. Yeah, I mean, these are a little bit unusual for us to buy. We normally just deal in, in English um, campaign and travel items. And these are French Grand Army Napoleonic miniature helmets. But sometimes you see something and the quality of it and the beauty of it as a dealer and hopefully as a customer, you just think, God, I've got to have that. That's fantastic. <laughs> and we've got a collection, you can maybe see them behind me, um, of 24 of these. And they were made around about 1900, either side of 1900, by a Frenchman called Charles Sandra. Basically for people to collect, but they are made uh, with the same attention to detail and the same quality of materials as the original Shaco. So, you know, they're lined in red silk. I mean, just the work into this plume, just fantastic. Is it? Um, and there's a, a Hussard's Busby here as well. Oh, they're just okay. wonderful. And yes, they're being seen on the first time at one o'clock today on Lapada Firsts. So thank that's you. Thank That'll be their first opportunity uh, coming up for sale. Amazing. Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing them all in detail. Um, take, I know we've sort of talked about maybe a, a chest being the sort of the starting point of um, collecting uh, campaign furniture. Do you want, I know you've got some images as well, and perhaps you, there's one thing I would love. I love that, the, the table. But anyway, if Gillian shares the screen and you could maybe give okay. them through some of your key objects and then we can... Um, well, I, I think um, oh, really. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, and this is something I've actually got here ah, as okay. well. So uh, it would probably be better if we got rid of that photograph, Julian, if we could. Well, let's talk about this. Um, yeah. I mean, I think what uh, what unites us, the three of us, as dealers. And of course, what this talk is all about is why are people interested in these things? And it's the wow factor. It's the wow factor either because the design is fantastic and it does something um, very clever, which we'll come on to later, or it's the history behind it. And this trunk, Captain Blackwood's Waterloo trunk, as we called it, was just the perfect storm for us as a piece of research. It was actually the people's choice for the Lepardo object of the year in 2012. And what we found out about this trunk it was made by Thomas Hanford, who uh, had a business on the Strand. He kept on moving between shops on the Strand. And in January 1815, he moved to number seven Strand, which is the address on the label of this trunk. But the owner engraved to the top is Captain Blackwood's 69th Regiment. And after Napoleon was sent off to Elba, uh, Blackwood's um, original regiment was disbanded. And then when Napoleon came back, he re-enlisted and joined the 69th Regiment. So he had to have bought this trunk after January 1815, when Hanford moved addresses, and as he joined the 69th Regiment. And he would have bought it to take to France to go and fight Napoleon. And the reason that we know that he had to have bought it in that period is because sadly he, uh, he died at Waterloo and he's buried at the orchard at Hougoumont. So from a research point of view and a historical point of view, it's just, wow, this item was probably at Waterloo. And you tell somebody that when they come into the shop about a piece. And you can see her eyes light up. It's mm. just, you're immediately there and it's not just a antique and what am I gonna do with it? It's my goodness, what a piece of history. So that's, that's great as far as we're concerned from research. And a lot of our items, you know, we manage to, if they've got a, an owner's name, we can go through the army lists and all the rest of it, do our research and find out when they bought it, depending on his rank on the uh, piece, and where he might have been, where this piece might have traveled, and its history comes alive. But the other wow factor, um, and of course this relates to Alan's stock, 
and Tim Stock is the the clever design, the ingenuity of design. And perhaps, Gillian, if you could move on to the Thornhill briefcase table. I love this. This is another thing. Um, and hopefully you can imagine that uh, when those straps are removed from the table as a briefcase and it's lied down on its side, basically you undo a couple of clips. You've got some finger holes. It, uh, you put your fingers in, you just lift it up and the legs stand on its hinges and then you put down the angle bracing bars, lock those, and all of a sudden you've got a table which has come out of nothing. Um, and the ingenuity of design is just fantastic. This one was made by Thornhill, who were high-end retailers on New Bond Street. The design's also commonly as associated with uh, Albert Barker, who was another high-end retailer, and he started off in partnership with Thornhill um, between 1875 and 1885. But then also Tim was probably had a few of these. They also made a version which turned into a picnic basket. So instead of a card table at the top, there was actually a wicker basket at the top, at the top which was full of all the items you'd need for a good picnic and it would fold out. And uh, GW Scott and Sons are, are known for making those. But just a fantastic piece of design, really. Do you, when you they, get... They when, when you receive something like that, do you immediately know how it works because you've been doing this so long or, or are there some where you're slightly dumbfounded before you can find the hidden catches or where you put your fingers or how to... Well, there, there are some pieces, yeah. And certainly <laughs> with, with secret drawers. Yeah. Um, and your, your brain gets tuned in when you deal in a certain field to look for certain things. So we've bought campaign furniture off... Uh, other people before and they never realized it was made to dismantle but because your brain is locked in your eyes locked in you realize there's something just slightly off with the design and then you wonder why and with secret drawers as well you pull out a little drawer of a secretaire and you think well that's way too short for the space of a box uh something must be going on behind and you investigate um and occasionally you might find a medal or something exciting in there <laughs> I remember Butcher <laughs> found somebody's jawbone in a secret drawer, of something, which was <laughs> kind of interesting. What, what else have we got? Have we... Well, um, if any... we... Oh, yeah. Well, these are bright and buns. If we come off the screen, Gillian, then I can um, actually show people. Now, bright and buns are, again, just a classic piece of design. So much so that they were made for probably over 150 years started off in the 18th century with very smart silver sets. And in the 19th century, uh, you get a lot of brass ones. These are cast brass. And basically, they're two candlesticks. So we unscrew the top, and you've got two dishes, and then you've got the two sconces, and you screw it in like that. And you've got a candlestick. Um, just fantastic design and very compact it makes its own packing case for travel yeah. and they made these in lots of different materials over a long period of time so this set are pressed brass um, they're closer to 1900 in date uh, oriental hardwood um, silver and a, a wide range of prices as well um, from say a hundred pounds up to getting on for probably 10,000 for a good pair of silver 18th century Brighton buns in their case, but just fantastic design. Um, and Gillian showed earlier on the screen. Um, oh, it's this, tiny. But uh, you wouldn't have seen it like this. This is a candlestick. Yeah. And, and, and just the ingenuity of design. So if we unfold it like that, we've got a cricket and then we can remove the wow. drip pan oh. on that. And then you've got three legs which fold Amazing. out like that and it'll stand. And then you can and write your little journal of the day of what happened exactly, at Waterloo. Exactly. Um, and I'm just really clever, clever design. Um, 
do they I know I mean a lot of it is obviously very practical things but do do they do you have sort of gaming tables and things like that Hello? as well that... sorry do you have um sorry. gaming tables and and things like that as well that people Funnily really... you should say that fair but uh <laughs> of course you didn't have tv in those days so you had to do something in your downtime um yeah. so a roll-up chessboard amazing very useful, but, and that's uh, late 19th century, but going a little bit earlier in date, um, we've got a chess box here, but in it, we have got the means to turn it into a table. So you've got tripod legs. Wow. You've got a column which screws to it. Will then extend. <laughs> and then the top will sit on it like that. And all of a sudden, you've got a chess table. Ready for a game. Amazing. Ready for a game. That's gorgeous. Uh, fantastic so, design. So how, I, I'm just sort of conscious of time, but in for all of you, and maybe I'll, I'll start with, with you, Alan, in terms of the, the disciplines that you cover, do, the, do, do we just have to sort of sit back and appreciate these items or can we use some of them? Well, um, yes, I mean, uh, I mean, I don't know when you're going to use a, a traction torpedo. I mean, I, no. I, wouldn't mm. advise, I wouldn't advise anyone to use one of those, but certainly, uh, the binoculars, uh, the, uh, they're always uh, uh, fully functioning, you know, and yeah. they're always restored. Uh, 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 um, both him and I, you know, we restore them and they're, they're fabulous to use. And they're actually so extraordinary that unless you've owned one or have used one, uh, it, it, the quality isn't appreciated. And it's, and, and I'm sure uh, Tim will agree, but, you know, if you actually get a, pa a pair outside and let somebody look at something a couple of miles away, yeah. Their, their world is complete. You know, you uh, you completely transform people. Uh, understanding of what a, a really well-made optical instrument is, and and um, so they're very they're very usable. And then uh, uh, the the furniture is usable, and the luggage is you know, uh, I I mean, there are multiple uses, of, and 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 values are always going up. So even if it's not something that you can use all the time, it's certainly to be appreciated and. It does appreciate, you know, because these things are becoming more and more scarce. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think there's an ass assumption that you can't use things, but actually, most of these things, the campaign furniture was made with incredibly robustly, designed mm. exactly to be thrown around by the roughest, uh, the roughest sort of environment. In the, and also with the binoculars, they were made for, they were really made without budget, and and all these things were were, you know, in, in there isn't, there is, it's very, except in the military world today, you're not in spheres where there is no budget. And so these things are optimum quality and optimum, they're made to endure. So it's not a, you know, it, it's something to really, to, to value and treasure and, and really use. And, you know, if yeah. you've got a place on Côte d'Azur up in the mountains or just a great view over a city, it, it really, or just looking at the moon. I mean, the, the most, uh, the, 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 the lowest power binocular, you ought to see beautiful craters on the moon. And, and I mean, in, I have one at home and I use it with my child all the time. And she just, you know, she's fascinated. She says, Dad, can I see the moon? And that, it, you know, that's what you do. I, it strikes me actually with all of your areas that, that it's a great sort of entry into collecting and for children because of the ingenuity. And so whatever age and whatever sort of um, budget you have that mm. people would be sort of enchanted by coming into one of your shops and finding something I, yeah. I think and uh, did you, you had maybe an example of that Sean did you have school children or something did you do something nice well, school? yeah we, we've had um, local school kids come to our exhibitions and you can see when they walk through the shop door that they think what are we doing here it's boring <laughs> antiques but then all of a sudden you say to them, why do you think this chair is made to fold up so quickly on board a ship? <laughs> and you say to them, because when the call clear the decks comes up, you've got to get all of the cannon into action and the cannon <laughs> were all over the ship. 
And so you've got to move the furniture quickly. And if you can't move it quickly, it's overboard. So naval furniture, you don't have a bolt that you've got to undo and legs with screws on, takes too long. And all of a sudden, the stuff is cool and exciting. And you're on a battleship in a war fighting uh, Napoleon or you're, you're at Trafalgar on a naval chair. Do and any it of comes the, alive. Does anyone, does anyone persuade mum and dad to walk out with one for them for their bedroom? I, can, I mean, my son would definitely be nagging for... <laughs> well, yeah, occasionally, yeah. I mean, you know, when, when kids come into the shop and um, you can tell a lot of the time they just want to move on to the next shop, but the parents want to look, then <laughs> you, you've got to say to them, I bet you can't find the secret drawer on this campaign chest. Yeah. And you give them a few clues and all of a sudden, you know, it's an antique, but even though mum and dad said, don't touch anything when you come in, the owner of the shop is saying, yeah, touch it, play with it, let's have some fun. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, and that's what it's all about. And as Alan said, this stuff, um, most of it apart from his torpedoes, are there to be used. <laughs> a lot of people buy campaign chests for their son's bedrooms. If it survived a war, hopefully it will survive a 15 year old boy. <laughs> I love that. Tim, in terms of sort of your, your collector base, what, 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 what is your collector base uh, in terms of um, who, who is, you know, who's collecting? And if you were going to, because it's so varied what you sell, and yes, the core is all the luggage. So what would you start as, I suppose, with as a quintessential piece? Mm -hmm. But then, um, yeah. Well, I think it's a, I mean, our collect, the collector base is, is yeah. now very global and you know that that is a huge positive of the internet that it has broadened our customer base so much mm. i mean entry level I, i'd always say if you were looking for a piece of luggage to actually look for an english brand because i think they represent incredible value you know if you can afford a viton trunk fantastic i mean it, it's going to appreciate probably more than anything else. But actually you can look at a piece of by Asprey or Insul or Drew and Sons and the quality was equally good. And yet it's, you know, it's a much more accessible level. But I mean, then it sort of broadens out into, you, there are so many different fields. You can go into sporting, you can go into you know, cigar, barware. But I might, we're saying about people using things. I, I think there's nothing better. Everything should be used, you know. Yeah. You shouldn't be afraid to take your wardrobe trunk with you. And, you know, it's a good excuse. To. You talked, at the beginning, you talked about polishing. Is that, you just use ordinary sort of shoe polish, do you? On the, I, I mean, do, obviously yeah, you yeah. get, not for your very expensive Louis Vuitton, you might ask someone to help you. But, I mean, yeah. presumably these pieces, if you handle them and touch them, that maybe does them good in a way. Yeah, absolutely. With leather, it absolutely does yeah you, yeah just, you can see a, for instance in a cigar case where it's been handled you know the natural oils in your hand actually are perfect it's such a natural material that in the mm. end that it needs that nourishment so i think it's always you need to be careful with polishing because it is actually you know with leather particularly it's easy to spoil it but be cautious but treat it like your favorite pair of shoes yeah. And in terms of, I mean, one of the other things that strikes me, and we've, we've talked about it a little bit, but is this sort of the craftsmanship. Hmm. And uh, um, I just wonder, I think, have you been involved with London Craft Week at all? To, I mean, has, yeah, it, yeah. has yeah. it helped yeah. in terms of hmm. people appreciating and understanding? Um, because you actually your reference to Asprey, my first job, my Saturday hmm. job was in Asprey Leather Department. And I remember my okay. favorite was going to the workshops up yeah. above, which have most, most of them have gone. But sadly, yeah, yeah. But actually, that is that is emblematic of how those businesses grew. You know, they they yeah. valued their craftsmen and they, you know, celebrated them and had them in the shop. And I think it's a great shame now that a lot of mm. businesses have sort of relegated them really to a to a factory elsewhere, whereas they were completely, you know, incorporated into the business. I mean, I think London Craft Week has been an incredible um, spark for broadening people's appreciation of craftsmanship. And we do see it and people, people just look at things with more understanding now. And I think the more you learn about how things are made, you, the, the better you appreciate them. And, and Craft Week has done great things. And, yeah. I, 
I'm Good. loving, I'm, I'm getting distracted by the gyroscope, just kind of, you <laughs> know, it's lovely. I love it. It's great. It's reminding well, me. It. Yeah, that's, <laughs> it is actually, it's indicative of, 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 of the involvement, actually. Uh, yeah. When you say, you know, I, I was going to say that uh, uh, I bring, I, I, this is at home, not because I want to, well, as it turned out, it was here anyway, but it's at home because I, I show it to my child, my little one. Yeah. And, and I often bring toys home, and I think that um, although uh, we we deal in 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 um, some things that are quite expensive or, or uh, larger priced items, there are a lot of nice small things that you can buy. They're toys, wooden toys, they're train sets, mechanical wind up train sets, and it's and it's um, it, it's a great way of it. everyone thinks that um, you you must have an iPad or something, but actually these toys we experience it a lot in, in our house because yeah of, of our community so we bring toys you know wind up toys and games and and the kids i love it and you can find great small toys for tens of pounds all over the place at work little uh, uh, games at ice hockey get uh, wooden toys from the 50s 20s and it's okay to use them it's even okay to break them because that's what they were made for but the kids in general it completely blows their mind. You get these kids coming and they just think, wow, what is this? What, you know, and yeah. um, so we, we, there is a, uh, I, I feel there's a duty for the dealers to actually show and bring children in. And, and the, because, um, I mean, you're talking yeah. to, to the three people that are actually quite open-minded. I mean, I never tell children not to touch in the shop yeah. unless it's, I'm worried that it might fall on them, but not yeah. actually, that's, that's my only worry. But it's not, it's not because I'm worried they're going to break anything because it's already been there for a hundred years at least, or maybe, you know, so. But I, I think it's very important to bear that in mind and, we, and you uh, uh, open up uh, children's minds, even if they don't want to become a collector. Yeah. They, they, have a, they have an exposure to wonderful things and, and realize that there's much more going on than just you know, the screen. <laughs> yeah, no, I, th I, I think you're so right. And I think um, it's something that dealers are getting. I mean, you, you, you're right, you're a different breed, but I think people are getting more comfortable with it. And it's something that the auction houses, I think, did very well early on yes. in that when I was studying for my A-levels, I just used to go to them and there you were allowed to touch everything and look at everything in a preview, whether it was kind of even Van Gogh, you know, you could get someone to, to let you have a look at it and having that access that normally is either behind a door with a bell on it or in a museum. And I think, yeah, you're very generous. I've watched you with my own son kind of. Um, <laughs> and I, and nice. I was going to say, I think your son <laughs> sat on an ejection seat once. Yes, he? He, yes. Um, and yeah. through the binoculars and probably stuck his fingers all over the glass lens. But anyway, um, we, we are running out of time. And I just wondered, um, Gillian, did you did you have any additional questions you wanted to ask before I sort of did a thank you? I don't have any questions right now. That was really interesting to hear about all those different pieces. But um, yeah. Well, I thank you so, so much for your time. I'm very conscious. I mean, we're extra lucky that we've got you uh, today when your shops have all just reopened. So I really hope you do some great trading over the next few weeks in the, the run up to Christmas and way beyond, actually. I mean, let, let's hope that we uh, can continue to stay open for a while. Um, today, we are launching Lapada First. Uh, Sean very kindly gave a mention to that earlier. And this is um, a preview um, of a selection of items from Lapada members that are nowhere else on the website. And for those five days, they won't be on their own website or any other marketplaces. So um, we thought that people are really missing that sort of um, tension and preview of being able to go to a fair or an exhibition. And so this is your online version and it will be once a month, the first Thursday of every month, we will preview some of those items. So um, I hope, I think it launches at 1 p.m. today. Is that correct, Julian? Yes, that is correct. Yes. Thank you. All right. So log on and enjoy. Um, and thank you so much, Tim, Sean and Alan, uh, for this morning's thank conversation. Uh, we will, it'll be on YouTube and we can share it um, so that other people can watch it as well. But thank you so much for your time today. Uh, thank you for Cultural Comms for um, creating uh, Lapada Leaders for us and also for Gillian um, who put it all together. So thank you so, so much um, and enjoy the rest of your day and see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.